Ubisoft says their open worlds are here to stay. Apple are joining the game subscription service battle. Nintendo are bringing the hammer down on ROMs once more. And Steam is seemingly coming up with a new way to open up your wallet. All of this and more on today's episode of The Roundup. Hey everyone and welcome back to another episode of The Roundup. Plenty's been going on this week between legal battles and future plans, so we've got a lot to cover. Before we get started though, as always, be sure to like, subscribe and ring that bell. As you know, it really helps us out with YouTube. If you want to discuss this video further, hit up our shiny new Discord. Anyway, let's get going. So some Steam news to start off with, and this one really is, I think it's a masterclass in identifying problems and reacting to them. So here's the background to this. Earlier this week, Mike Rose of No More Robots revealed his uh, findings of a month-long investigation into how games are actually selling on Steam these days. Now, the full report is linked in the description, it's worth checking out, but we've selected some of the highlights for you here. Now, he goes into detail about the stipulations used in his research, such as eliminating AAA games uh, and then games with fewer than 10 user reviews. So, ones that people have actually you know, bought but are not from a massive company. Now, Rose concludes that in 2019, the average Steam game sells 1,500 copies, which is down 70% year on year. And uh, the average game makes $16,000 in revenue, which is down 47% year on year. Quite staggering. These figures account for the first year of sale and assume that the game follows the average release price point of $10. While Rose eliminated a large portion of games from the investigation, this does tell us that 78% of games released on Steam Steam make less than five grand in their first year. So, from these figures, you can see that the average game release in Steam is making half as much money uh, this year as it made last year. And Rose suggests a number of reasons for this. He states that the average developer is pricing their game lower now, and that's certainly not helping them. He also speculates that more people could be playing free to play games like Fortnite and League of Legends, which is fairly obvious. Now, there's one major reason that Rose points to, though, and that is the sheer number of games releasing on Steam. Rose writes, that around 900 games were released on Steam during his investigation period between the 5th of July and the 6th of August. And uh, that that number is just increasing month on month. So there are many different factors there that actually just involve like, will a game actually be seen or not? And the marketplace being crowded is one of them. Even just something as simple as a genre being overpopulated can have a massive impact on average sales. There are only so many pixel art roguelike dungeon crawlers that you can actually play. Subscription services and players backlogs are also cited as uh, being some of the reasons for a decrease in player engagement. It's hard to justify a new purchase when you look at your library and think, oh dear, there are 200 games here I haven't played. So what are Steam doing about this? Because you can be darn sure that if we've noticed the problem, so is Steam. Well, we reported on the channel a few videos ago that Steam are, I'm getting it, well, they're doing a bit of a facelift in order to add some new functionality, such as a revised library offering more streamlined navigation. But we also in that video reported that Steam Labs would be changing the way Steam recommendations work and they're going to be making recommendations based off personal play history rather than general user-based popularity. Steam are craftier than we give them credit for though because that new recommendation system we talked about, that was actually rolled out behind the scenes to around 5% of Steam users over the past few weeks. Now Valve have released figures stating that users in the test group were 15% more likely to click on recommended games, which in turn drove to a 75% increase in unique game visits and a 47% percent increase in unique visits per game. So quite clearly, this works, and Valve have announced that the new recommendation system should be rolling out to uh, users anytime now, and uh, the new Steam library update will follow shortly. And this is hopefully going to streamline the whole like Steam user experience, and it'll actually mean that your Steam front page is a bit more tailored to what you've played in the past, which I think will generally be a good thing. There's so much noise to signal, I suppose, on Steam. So overall, it seems like this is a win for players, developers, and Steam itself. Now that said, it's unlikely to fix the problem that Mike Rose outlined. Saturation in the market's just naturally going to result in a smaller share of the pot for devs, but I think this certainly is a good step. It's not a one sh like it's not a one-shot win, but it's a good thing to have in the toolkit. Next up, we've got some Ubisoft news courtesy of the company's CEO. In an interview with GamesIndustry.biz, which primarily focused on how Ubisoft's name is being more and more synonymous with open-world adventures, he was asked whether the company would ever return to their more condensed storytelling format. Now, the two examples given to 
illustrate this point were basically Assassin's Creed Unity and Assassin's Creed Odyssey. 2014's AC Unity had a storyline that could be beaten in 15 hours, whereas last year's Assassin's Creed Odyssey had a main campaign that would take up 60 hours of the player's time. That certainly is quite a jump, and it reflects changing attitudes in Ubisoft's management, as much as it also reflects advancements in their capabilities as an organization. In other words, Ubisoft sandboxes are bigger, or at least longer these days, because they actually have the means to be bigger, and that's something they've actively been trying to pursue. And when you look at the size of some of these dev teams, it is, I mean, it is staggering. There's some AC games where it's like over a thousand people have worked on it. It's, it's just mad. Now, speaking on the company's longer-term goals for its open-world adventures, the CEO, Yves Gil Gilmore, I think, uh, it's French, let me know in the comments if I got it right, um, he stated that Ubisoft's goal is, quote, to make sure you can have unity inside an odyssey. And he basically meant that if an in-house development team wants to have a 15-hour-long story, they still can do that, but it's got to be a part of a wider, bigger, overarching plotline. In his interview, he points to the average 60-hour playtime of AC Odyssey and highlights that the larger scope of the game meant that, quote, players got a lot more from their investment in the game, a lot more than they got before. So bigger games are a success in Ubisoft's eyes, and to them, bigger game clearly means open world. Ubisoft essentially are open world games at this point. It's a lot of what they want to do, with many of their titles just moving in that direction. Now, of course, there are ones like Siege, which are not going to move in that direction, but you get the point here. Ubisoft's, of course, big release for Q4 of this year is Ghost Recon Breakpoint. That is a tactical shooter that is more, you know, still in that open world format that was so successful for Ghost Recon Wildlands, which, of course, is very different from many of the past Ghost Recon games. So while this is good news for people who like investing a lot of time in their games, it's obviously a blow to those who want the more streamlined approach of storytelling that Ubisoft used to champion back in the day. Eves' statement and insight into the direction that the company hopes to follow in the coming years I mean, it's interesting, but at all that ensures we'll never see, like, another traditional Prince of Persia game, for instance. And as good as Assassin's Creed Odyssey's world was, I'll be honest with you, I really did miss the more tight plot of Assassin's Creed 2 or Brotherhood. Anyway, let's move on. This week also saw the proper reveal of Apple's new gaming subscription service, Apple Arcade. You know what? I was surprised how good the offering seems to be. So an Apple livestream earlier this week provided us with a whole host of details. It's going to launch September 19th in 150 companies. It's going to cost $4.99 USD per month for the entire family of users, and it's going to release on iPhone, iPad, Mac, and Apple TV, and I believe is a free month as well. It's important to note, though, that it's not a cloud-based service. This is a monthly subscription fee that just gives you access to a library of titles to download onto your advice, so you're not going to have to worry about things like an unstable connection, and I'd far rather have that over $4.99 to give you access to a cloud streaming platform, as an example. Now, in terms of the games, you've got a little bit of a look. Uh, some of them are exclusive. Uh, Konami showed off Super Frogger, a new entry in that series, and there's also Exit the Gungeon, a bullet-held dungeon-climbing spin on the uh, recent successful uh, twin-stick shooter Enter the Gungeon. Now, the arcade is a promising enough move from Apple. It's uh, releasing this on a just so many devices. I mean, it's quite ridiculous how large their install base is, and the company are already pretty well-established in the gaming field. Now, originally when they pitched this, they talked about how free-to-play does well on mobile, but they're sad about premium, and really their focus here has like being on the likes of say like Konami and Capcom like known names within gaming it does show they want to bridge that gap uh, you know towards the core market and it's good that premium mobile and tablet games are getting a chance in the spotlight now while the format is not perfect for a first person shooter as an example mobile devices can play host to incredible experiences such as 80 days and my iPad Pro it geek benches at 18,000 which is about the same as an i5 8400 which is pretty darn ridiculous I I think it's really sad how we've got these devices with beautiful, incredible screens, you know, out there, and there could be so much more good done with them through premium games, but we're not seeing that because free-to-play has dominated that market. So even if something like Apple Arcade at least starts to make people think, ah, yeah, you know what, premium games actually can exist on an iPad or a phone, then I suppose that is a good thing. Next up, we've got a story featuring Nintendo's criminally overworked legal team. Those guys must be so busy. And their infinite war against ROMs. So, this week was revealed that Nintendo have been successful in a court case to block internet service providers in the UK from providing access to websites containing Nintendo ROMs. This new injunction will require Sky, BT, EE, TalkTalk, and Virgin Media to block, or at least impede, 
access to uh, four websites which aid in the distribution of pirated Switch software, modified Nintendo hardware, or provide information to mod consoles yourself for piracy-centric reasons. Now, the case was heard by the UK High Court. They upheld Nintendo's argument that by providing access to that sort of material, the websites were infringing on Nintendo's trademarks, uh, both facilitating and promoting piracy of Nintendo products. A spokesperson from Nintendo had this to say, the decision will help protect the UK games industry and the more than 1,800 developers worldwide that create games for the Nintendo Switch platform and who rely on legitimate sales of games for their livelihood and to keep bringing quality content to gamers. So that's all from Nintendo on the ROM front, though they did just also file a big juicy lawsuit against the owner of ROM website ROM Universe. The numbers here are eye-watering. Nintendo are seeking damages of $150,000 for each instance of copyright infringement and up to $2 million for each trademark infringement. So yeah, buckle up, ROM Universe. You um, seemingly have a near infinite amount of money that you have to pay up now, which obviously they don't have. Uh, Polygon writes that ROM Universe supposedly offer a premium membership uh, subscription for their site, with premium members having quicker access to the site's ROM library. Uh, Nintendo also carries that allegation forward in their lawsuit, saying that the premium subscription uh, allowed people to pirate a unlimited number of games with higher speeds than non-members. Now, Nintendo do get some stick for the vigor at which they fire out their season to assist letters, but at least they're consistent in their efforts to curb piracy for their games and, uh, you know, of their platforms. It's uh, a shame that with Nintendo in particular, strong attempts at conserving old games via emulation are getting caught in the crossfire of piracy. Uh, certainly, though, ROM Universe should not have been attempting to, uh, you know, to profit off Nintendo's content. I think that was a big mistake, and uh, that preservation angle, they really do lose any kind of moral argument there when they try to do that. Next up, Death Stranding because as we inch ever closer to Death Stranding's November release date, there's still so much that we just don't know about it. Well, a Tokyo game show presentation from Kojima himself uh, gave us an hour of, of the game, and... Uh I mean, it's testament to Kojima's weirdness and the incomprehensibility of Death Stranding that we were able to walk away from 50 minutes of raw gameplay footage still not knowing a whole lot about the thing. So the trailer showed off some delivery-centric gameplay where Sam Bridges just rambled about a big field for a while with his massive backpack. He eventually stopped for a rest, bringing in those moments of tranquility and recuperation that Sony seems so excited about. And indeed, uh, self-care seems to be something that's important in the game's mechanics because ensuring that Bridges is properly rested is vital and the more sort of content contemplative, uh, like, tone. I guess that just hints at elements of managing his mental burden as well as his physical one, which, given some of the visuals we've seen for the game, actually could lead to extremely interesting stuff, so I actually think that's pretty darn cool. Kojima Productions then released a seven-minute-long story trailer set in the Oval Office called Briefing, featuring Bridges, a lady named Emily, who is supposedly the president, maybe the president, and uh, some dude in a snazzy suit that has a black skull mask because of, uh, reasons. It's what Kojima does. He puts skulls and things. Let's move on to Kentucky Fried Chicken. This is a bizarre one, so KFC are releasing a dating sim. Made in collaboration with uh, developer PSYOP, Yes, PSYOP is their name. <laughs> the game is called I Love You, Colonel Sanders, a finger-licking good dating simulator, and it's due to hit Steam on the 24th of September as a free download. So that's happened. Uh, the player character is a promising culinary student studying alongside a young Colonel Sanders. Uh, in between classes and cooking battles, you uh, have to woo Colonel Sanders, which, I mean, we've obviously all wanted to do. Uh, you may even go into business with the Colonel after you graduate, and... Uh, I mean, yeah, the game's premise is a bit wild, but there you go. It certainly is a successful marketing uh, trick that they've done. Uh, you know, brands and corporations in recent years have put a lot of effort into being hip to it. Uh, just look at the Twitter accounts of Arby's and Wendy's and even the KFC gaming one. But a Carl Sanders dating sim, well, that certainly is one. It's, uh, I mean, it's even a little bit beyond product placement, like with Monster Energy drinks literally being a means to recover stamina in Death Stranding. Yes, Sam Bridges can just pop out a little Monster Energy and uh, get his stamina back. But what an incredibly bizarre world we all live in. Anyway, with that note, do check out the other two videos released on this channel. If you want a bit of World of Warcraft history, uh, you know, along with Classic coming out, we actually released uh, an episode of our WoW history uh, sort of documentary today over on our second channel, so you might enjoy that too. And then, of course, be sure to check out the Discord because there's a lot of good stuff going on there. Thank you very much for watching this video, and with that, I'll see you next time.